Welcome everybody. Good to see everyone again. Uh, okay, we can review the minutes of the previous meeting. I think um, you got them by email and then Mike just handed out um, um, hard copies. Has everybody had a chance to look? I would entertain. So I have one change, so. Yeah, um, okay. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't at the last meeting, so since I was present. Yeah. Okay. Good to take that off then. Uh, you're going to stay in the box. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So. Kara. Yeah, Kara. Uh -huh. so, Goodbye. Bye. 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 Have a nice day. Have a nice day. So I move that we uh, accept the minutes of the oh. As amended. As amended? As amended. Okay, great. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Mike, did you get that amendment? Uh, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Katie's the one who does this. Sorry. Great. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All right. We've approved <laughs> the minutes. And now we're... Hi, Kara. Yeah, hi. 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 <laughs> this is uh, Debbie Ingram. Um, so we're happy to have you join us uh, by Zoom, and uh, we're ready for you to to start with your presentation. Okay, great. I'm gonna. I did this yesterday, so I'm gonna try to again share my screen so you can see my slides. Uh huh. Yeah, we have a hard copy of them too. Great. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be able to talk with all of you um, and and hear about uh, the work you're doing. So um, I'll start with introducing myself, which might be helpful. My name is Kara. I am a vice president of Family Economics um, at First Focus, which is a bipartisan kids advocacy organization in D.C. We mostly work on federal policy, but do a little bit of, of state and local, and we kind of work on a range of issues affecting um, children and families, everything from health care to nutrition assistance to children in the budget um, and more. So I handle our child poverty portfolio as well as uh, housing and homelessness um, and have been working um, uh, for the past few years around this National Academy of Sciences study uh, that I'm going to kind of detail further. So it's great to be with you. and. Um, encourage a lot of questions at the end uh, as well. Um, so I think all of this data is probably not, I know, not new to anyone, but I always just kind of start out, especially because the new um, national census data came out. I know some of the state data is coming out this morning in like a half an hour, but uh, but you know, this past year um, we saw a little bit of a slight decrease in child in the national child poverty rate. Um, so about a million kids were lifted out of poverty last year, which of course is encouraging. Um, but we know our child poverty rate is still high. Um, it's still 16.2%, so about 12 million children nationwide. We know that there's still great disparities, so children of color still continue to experience poverty three times the rate um, that of white children. And um, we also know that children just disproportionately continue to experience poverty, right? They have higher rates of poverty than any age group. Um, in our nation, um, we calculate they are 54% more likely to have a poverty than adults um, at a higher rate. Um, and also, you know, when we compare ourselves to our other peer nations, our rate is still much higher um, than many countries that we compare ourselves to. So we know this is still a major problem, although we are happy that we saw kind of a slight decrease um, in this past year. Um, and, you know, as well as the kind of official poverty rate, which is the number that I just gave um, every year, right, well, for, you know, a little more recently, census <coughs> also report um, out a supplemental poverty measure, right, which kind of, um, you know, is a little more realistic because it takes into account a lot of different things, um, including, you know, the effective benefit program uh, for children, um, children and, and the larger public. But, you know, the numbers show that for children, these programs are particularly um, effective. And so you can kind of see here, right, um, a chart of the programs um, and how many children they listed out of poverty in 2018. So you can see that uh, tax credits, such as the earned income tax credit and child tax credit, um, listed the most, right? That's kind of has been consistent 
Um, so probably not a surprise, um, SNAP as well, also having a big increase housing subsidy. So um, we like to use both those numbers, right, uh, to show that, you know, when we take these programs into account, um, that the, you know, the child's uh, poverty rate does drop a little bit, and it drops more than it does for other populations, because, again, these programs are particularly effective for kids. So we always say we want to build on, right, what's working um, and do more so we can lift the other 60 million children um, that are still living in poverty. Um, so, uh, so first focus in 2015 um, had worked with members of Congress to um, to get a study from National Academy of Sciences funded for the federal appropriation process. Um, and so we went to a few members and said, you know, we know there's a lot of great research out there on child poverty, um, but it's often comes with a bias, right? It comes from a think tank that seems to either be left or right leaning. Um, or from a university that seems to be uh, left or right leaning. Um, and so we really want something from a little more of like a, a nonpartisan entity uh, that, you know, we know folks from both sides of the aisle um, would respect um, and make a of attention and kind of really be a good tool uh, to rally some good political will, right, and momentum around reducing child poverty. Um, we know we've seen other studies from the National Academy of Sciences in the past kind of have this effect and so um, so our ask was to fund a study from the National Academy of Sciences um, that would not only look at the problem, you know, kind of look at uh, the effect of poverty on children, um, the cost to our society, but also what we could do about it. And that last part we really pushed for because we knew any kind of recommendations or modeling from Manus, again, would have a lot of credibility and we don't want to dispose the problem right, but also talk about what we could do about it. Um, so we convinced them and, um, uh, and got funding for the study. And so it's been a long process. Um, it takes several years. It's a, it's a pretty big 600-page study. Um, but last February, it was released. Um, and we were really pleased with the findings. Um, they kind of have some big overarching takeaways that we think are really helpful um, for our work moving forward, as well as you know modeling of, of policy options of programs. Um, and I think, um, you know, I know Michelle has these materials. I'm happy to send them again after. Um, considering the study is 600 pages long, First Focus put together several materials to kind of make the study a little more digestible. Um, so we have kind of a big top takeaways uh, summary as well as a deeper dive that provides some context to the findings and talks about how it lines up with current policy proposals that we see in Congress or places that we think we need proposals um, if there aren't any already. Um, but kind of looking at the, you know, the overarching kind of top takeaways from the study, um, you know, the first big thing it says is that child poverty is solvable, right? Like, we can do something about it um, because it models policies, you know, and programs that if we implement them could cut our rate in half in 10 years. And um, we know that's the first critical step to being able to then end child poverty. Um, and so that alone is really helpful, right? Because we often hear about child poverty as being this intractable problem, really complex. So the fact that they said we could really make some big headway within 10 years was really helpful. Um, it also says that you know other countries have made progress, and in fact, which I'll get into in a little bit, you know we've made more progress in the past than have solved. So um, it shows it detailed kind of what the United Kingdom has done, um, what Canada is doing. Um, a little bit on what Ireland is doing. Uh, it doesn't include it, but New Zealand um, has been has been doing some good work. So we know other places have done it, um, or you know, are in the process of making some uh, better strides than we are. Um, and as well, we made some more progress in the past, so we should follow their lead. And we had asked them to do that. We wanted them to look at what other countries have done um, as well, because we thought it would be it would be helpful uh, to kind of bring some transferable themes for us. Um, it also says that, uh, that you know, income poverty itself is what causes poor outcomes in kids, right? So it's not other things that are correlated with poverty, but poverty itself, right? So not having enough resources in a household is what causes those negative outcomes, and therefore increasing those resources, right, can then, um, can then lead to those outcomes, which is really helpful as well, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, it also says that uh, money matters to reducing child poverty. When it talks about what other countries have done, it talks about that they've made much bigger investments than we have. 
they have more revenue and they use that revenue um, to combat uh, child poverty and it could work. Um, and we know we don't spend nearly enough on our children. Um, First Focus issues a children's budget book every year that kind of looks at federal spending on children. Um, the share of spending on children continues to decline. So um, this past year, it is at an all-time low, about 7% of the share of federal spending on children. But children make up about 23% of our population, so um, we know those numbers don't match up. Um, the study also says that uh, it makes smart economic sense to reduce child poverty, which is also a really helpful top takeaway because um, we know that's what we continually hear, right, is that we can't do some of these investments because we don't have the money. Um, but, you know, it finds that it actually saves us money to reduce child poverty. So, um, and again, I think this is something a lot of us know, but to have them say it, right, is helpful. So, uh, you know, it finds that child poverty costs our country about $1 trillion a year. Um, you know, due to uh, lost earnings and um, health care costs, uh, criminal justice costs, increased homelessness, child maltreatment. But yet, um, all of the policy and program options modeled, um, you know, if you put together the ones that would cut our rate half in 10 years, um, it, would only, it would cost about a tenth of that. So it costs about $100 billion a year to cut our child poverty rate in half within a decade compared to the one trillion a year that it costs us now. Um, and one of the last big takeaways is that um, it says that work requirements, so kind of you know policies with work mandated, um, you know, that, that mandated work within them kind of don't work for reducing child poverty. Um, it, it says that, you know, and I'm quoting, evidence was insufficient to identify mandatory work policies that would reliably reduce child poverty. And it appears that work requirements are at least as likely to increase as to decrease poverty. So it confirms that work requirements in programs like SNAP and Medicaid um, are actually harmful uh, for child poverty rather than um, helpful um, in helping parents uh, be able to secure employment that could, that could reach economic security. Um, and I'll, you know, and I, I, you know, I don't know how familiar everyone is with the NAS, but so what they do for these, this is a consensus study of theirs, and so what they do is they put together a set of folks, um, they form a committee, kind of a temporary committee for, for each study, and that committee is made up of a group of folks that is from all different viewpoints, so they're very careful to kind of have a balanced approach, so they have folks from more conservative think tanks as well as Left leaning. Um, they also, you know, they have uh, people from different universities, a lot of economists, uh, people who have been in this field a long time. Um, but again, you know, they really do try to take a balanced approach, um, a viewpoint that are folks that have to come to a consensus, right? So knowing that's who the group of folks that came up with these, um, you know, came up with these these findings is again really helpful and provides some credibility. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, um, this is just, I thought, a helpful chart to, you know, show that we have made progress in the past. Um, as you can see, you know, there was periods of our time where we did have really steep declines, um, partially due to, right, good economic uh, times, but also due to investments like the urban tax credit, the child tax credit, uh, SNAP and Medicaid. Um, but as you can see, that progress has slowed. Again, we say, especially in the past decade, it's really because of a lack of investment in children. We haven't had any kind of new programs for, um, or new investments in children in a while. And our, again, our federal spending right, continues, our share of spending on children continues to decline. And so we can see the results of that. Um, obviously, the recession didn't help. But we also know that child poverty, at least nationally, you know, remains fairly flat. Um, uh, as a result of you know some of the uh, investments we made through uh, through ARA and other things uh, that were fucked up uh, during the recession to respond. So, so those are some of kind of the top takeaways. Um, but you know, so they actually do get into a good amount of detail on different policies um, and the effect that these policies would have for different populations of children. So they found that not one single policy the program change could cut our rate in half in 10 years. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll mention here, so we had asked for actually their mandate to be able to find, um, you know, to model options 
that could cut our rate in half in 10 years. So we pitched half in 10 years, right? And I know you guys are familiar um, based on your work and your history because we've seen that in other places um, and felt like that 10 years kind of gives a sense of urgency. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, we always hear different views on whether 10 years is too soon or too long. Um, but, so yeah, that's what they're mandated to do. And then so they lay out these, uh, so they found that not one single policy or program change to cut our child poverty in half within 10 years, but instead um, there are packages of policies and program changes um, that have done together could have this change. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, they measured progress based on what we call an adjusted supplemental poverty measure. So, uh, you know, they found that um, there's a lot of underreporting of benefits uh, when it comes to measuring poverty, right? If you look at administrative records, um, a lot of people might not report that they're on SNAP or other things either because they might not realize or they don't want to reveal that. And so uh, they kind of adjusted the supplemental saying that actually these programs have an even bigger effect um, because of underreporting than we realized. And so, um, so they're basing it on an SPM that's a little bit lower than, uh, than what the census reports every year. Um, and that's how they kind of measure progress based on that. So they wanted to be as realistic and honest as possible um, and show the true effects of these programs. So they modeled four different policy packages. Um, and two of them would have an effect of cutting child poverty in half um, within a decade. And the policy packages that had um, that effect included the um, improvements to the earned income tax credit, the child independence care tax credit. Um, it included an establishment of a child an annual child allowance. Um, it increased the number of housing vouchers that would be available. Um, it increased the minimum wage. Um, some other things that are not on the slide, but it modeled a child support guarantee of about $100 to $150 a month for families on a child support order. It expanded benefits um, for immigrants, right, so improved access to benefits for immigrants. Um, and so, you know, uh, we have analysis that kind of shows, right, all the different packages um, and, and the effect they would have. But the two that had that effect included all the things I just mentioned. Um, and they found that an annual $3,000 child allowance um, per child uh, and also distributed monthly, right? Because we have families have expenses uh, monthly and not and not just annually. That would have the biggest impact. Um, and in fact, we cut our deep child poverty rate in half within a decade. And so we thought that was uh, really notable. You know, again, almost every country we compare ourselves to has some kind of child benefit, right? So then the child is born, a family automatically gets a payment per month to help with expenses. Um, sometimes that amount is bigger, right? When a child is younger, you knowing expenses are higher. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that we don't have anything like that, you know, we have a child tax credit, which is really important, but it doesn't reach those families at the bottom because you have to have some earnings to be able to get um, anything and be able to get the full amount, you have to have more earnings, right? So, so this would just be, um, and there's different ways to model it, right? You could cap it um, for people, you know, once you get up to a certain income, phase it out or tax it at a certain income, um, but, you know, but looking at a, so they did, you know, they did phase it out at a certain point, but looking at um, a $3,000, you know, a year child allowance um, would almost cut child poverty in half. And we know that cutting deep child poverty in half is really critical because a lot of those families, um, you know, parents might not be able to work due to disability or substance abuse or other barriers. Um, and so that, uh, the fact that that child in those households would be able to get a floor of resources no matter kind of what's going on while we kind of help those parents um, is, uh, is really critical. Um, and right now, you know, those children are the ones that might not be able to get much assistance because for many of our, uh, you know, many of our programs need to have some earnings to be able to, uh, to be able to access those programs. So we know we're missing a lot of kids um, at the very bottom and this would target them. Let's see what else I wanted to highlight. So yeah, here's a helpful chart to kind of show the um, the effect of, I know those numbers kind of on the right hand side are, are not that helpful, but at least you can just see visually, right, the different um, policies that they modeled. And so they modeled not just the ones I mentioned, they modeled SSI, they modeled the child care subsidies, um, and the effect that those would have on reducing our child poverty rate. Um, 
And as you can see, the child allowance. So, and they model kind of different amounts for each one. So that's just the child allowance one, child allowance two. So usually the first one is a little bit of a lesser amount. Um, so the child allowance one is $2,000 a year, child allowance two is, is 3000 And again, that would be as a fully refundable um, amount that would be given. It would actually be administered through the Social Security uh, Administration. Um, you know, in our analysis, we provided some more context of some of these because we know some of them to be, um, uh, look like they don't have as much of an impact as we think they would have. So for example, the minimum wage, they actually only modeled it at 1025 an hour um, because that was the latest data they had um, from the Congressional Budget Office. Um, but we know that, uh, you know, the House passed the $15 minimum wage. We know that's where our proposals, we know some states already have a higher minimum wage than 1025. So, um, so they admitted, right, that their modeling was a little old, but they felt like based on national data, that's what they could do at the time. Um, also with looking at um, expanding access to uh, benefits for immigrants, they, you know, they did not model, uh, model uh, expanding access to tax credits, as you know, it had the biggest impact for immigrants, but they look at other means-tested programs, um, such as uh, SNAP and Medicaid, um, and that had a more limited effect because um, a lot of kids, first of all, a lot of kids could already get SNAP um, within a five-year window, right? If, um, if they're a legal permanent resident or undocumented, um, it would have a bigger impact. Uh, but the take-up rate might be lower. SNAP is still kind of small amounts per month, but it would be significant. Um, you know, something to note, so you don't see like Medicaid in here, right? Um, the supplemental poverty measure does not include Medicaid. Um, we know they have a big discussion around Medicaid and how important it is for kids and that we know it um, increases family resources, right? And it's money that families would not have to put towards health care, um, as well as the person for child health, right? Which lifts kids out of poverty in the long term. But, um, but you know, since it's not modeled for actually right, how much it could save a family per month, because that could differ so much, uh, they don't model it here, but they mention how important it is. Um, and so expanding access to Medicaid, for example, for immigrant families, you can't really see the effect in these numbers, but we know it would have an effect. Um, so Car a lot of Cara, uh, sorry, can I interrupt you a second? We had a, a question of, about reading this chart. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I'm, it may be just morning, but I'm, I'm not getting fully understanding the graph at the bottom. The zero through 14, is that a percent? What, help me to understand that better. I get, I get the Yeah, start. I just, Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's, so the 14 is about, um, so 14 is the percent of, is the poverty rate using the adjusted SPM that they found. Okay. So we found that 14% of kids, so and, and to make it even more confusing, right, so I just, so the supplemental poverty rate for 2018 from the Census Bureau was actually 14% for kids, but they're using old numbers, right, so they were doing this in 2015, so it was all higher, but using their adjusted supplemental poverty measure, it, they found about 14% of kids living in poverty, so to cut that in half, right, so that goal, that line you see. The goal is a seven. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Saying, I, I have another question about the child allowance. Um, so, mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, I think playing devil's advocate, um, you could look at this as um, kind of an incentive for people to have more children if they're going to get more uh, more money. I and mean, some people cynical people might say that, you know, if we're paying people to have children, that they would have more children, and then that would actually have an adverse effect on the poverty rate. It, it, has there been discussion about that, um, or how you would, um, you know, mitigate against that? Yeah, I mean, I know there's studies that kind of show that that effect is pretty small. Um, it's also only about 250 dollars a month, right, so it's not like it's going to be like
the concern is that you give those families, right, you know, two hundred fifty dollars a month, whatever, for a period of time, um, and then if you take that away, they're back in poverty, right? But we know for children that's not the case because, um, you know, when children's brains are developing, if they're getting those extra resources, right, they're going to do better, and so they're going to have better health outcomes, they're going to have better educational outcomes, they're going to have higher earnings as adults, and studies show that. And so that they will be able to break the cycle, right, of poverty by getting these extra resources early on. Um, and so it does have a long-term effect. It's not, you know, just a temporary kind of standing. Um, and, uh, you know, this study doesn't model some things that I know people would have liked to see, um, like two-generation approaches, right, things that would help parents, such as support for higher education, um, job training. They have that work advanced program, which they model pretty small. but. Um, uh, I think that's kind of people see as, as long-term like, ways to, um, you know, to help reach families with economic mobility. And, you know, we always say we need both. Um, you know, we know that some of those, uh, you know, ways to help, you know, families kind of reach economic mobility, um, we know families face a lot of barriers. And we know that might be, you know, that might take a little while. Um, and again, there might be some parents who are never going to be able to work through the disability, mental health, what have you. And so we want to make sure those children have a floor of resources, right, while the brains are developing, and so we can break the cycle that way. Um, but we know we need to be doing both. And because the study has this 10-year window, they can't look at things that um, would have an impact a little bit further out. So you notice there's no early childhood programs on here um, besides child care, right, the child care subsidies, so there's no Head Start, um, there's no paid family leave. Um, there's a bunch of things that people, including us, right, find really important, and we know have an effect. And they talked about a lot of those things. We could not model them because they're not within the 10-year window, but we know they're important. Um, so we, you know, we have said we wanted a sense of urgency um, uh, to, to do some of this, but that, um, you know, our analysis and theirs talked about all these other things that we need to be doing at the same time. Um, one of the biggest things you'll notice is not on here, which they, they do talk about, and I know given, um, uh, the work that happened in Vermont last year is there's no TANF on here. Um, they said that uh, TANF it was too hard to model, given that states spend in so many different ways, it was too hard to model improvements to TANF um, and the effects those would have on reducing child poverty. Uh, so, but they talk about it being important, um, and they talk about you know ways they could potentially improve it, but again, that it's hard just given the state that it's in. Um, so we don't, you know, in our analysis, you know, we make sure to, to talk about that. We don't want this to be seen as improvements to TANF, right, are useless, that we should not be working to improve TANF at all. Um, but we know that some serious reforms would be needed to, uh, you know, ensure that families are able to get uh, cash assistance. Um, and so, so yeah, so, you know, that is definitely something um, to note as well. Uh, but we know that it's so critically important. Um, okay, we, we have one other question. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi. Uh, back a few slides ago, you talked about um, that nationally we spend 7% uh, on children, even though they make up 23% of our population. And just, it, it, did that include education, or was that just this array of services and supports that you represent on these graphs? Um, so no, that so it's actually about 200 programs that are included in our children's budget book, and I'll make sure, Michelle, I'm, I think, um, you know, uh, have access, but I could also make sure to send a link so everyone can see that. Um, yeah, so we look at about 200 programs in the federal budget that um, where at least the share, right, of those programs are going to kids. So it's a pretty broad array. It includes federal education spending. So it doesn't include state education spending, right? It doesn't include state child welfare spending. Um, we know a lot of that, you know, but it happens on the state level, but as far as federal, we look across the board. So we don't just look at anti-poverty programs. Um, that are listed here. We look at a whole bunch. We don't look at international. We just look at, again, federal domestic, um, even though that might change soon. But uh, so yeah, we do, look at, we do look at education spending. We look at you know, military spending that might go to kids, right, um, and military families. We look at a whole array. So the only federal programs, not state, where the bulk, yeah, of, only the, federal. bulk of education is state. Yeah. OK. For sure, and so another resource that would be good to look at is um, the Urban Institute every year puts out a report they call Kids Share, um, and so we kind of work in tandem on those, uh, and that actually just came out as well um, in September, and that does look at uh, state spending as well. 
but those numbers aren't good either, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Ask the question. Yes, we have another question. Hi. Um, yeah, no, great. Back under your findings, you said something to the effect of it's about the money, not about other factors related to poverty. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I mean, you know, first of all, they're looking right at a, um, if we're trying to measure progress, right, they're looking at a measure that looks at income and tracks income. Um, and so I think they wanted to respond to the idea that just tracking income, you know, whether that's important or not, um, or whether that's not telling the whole story. And they argue that that is important, um, and that is the way to actually show progress um, and that measure alone is indicative of how children are doing because studies have shown that it's actually really the lack of resources in a household um, that is what affects negative child outcomes. Um, and so, so it's actually it's the lack of money. Um, and of course, we know that families face a lot of barriers, right? Um, but for example, you know, they talk about how when you look at child maltreatment, um, child maltreatment rates are higher for children living in families who are in poverty, but that is often linked to parental stress, right, and, um, and dynamics that would not be the case if that family was, uh, was better off. You know, of course, we know we need a lot of different um, interventions, right, and, and I should say interventions and services, right, um, and support for families, um, but we know that even with all those other barriers, if kids have at least a floor of resources like nutrition, like you know, stable shelter, um, uh, a good education, we know that that really, you know, that can, you know, that can provide the floor and give kids enough of a chance, right? Um, and kind of put kids at equal footing. Um, and and so, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to address. I think that they felt that um, being able to uh, measure based on income was pretty telling. Um, and so they talk about a lot of other factors that are correlated with poverty, um, but that is the poverty itself, uh, you know, that really is important to look at and increasing resources really can turn the tide. Yes, we have another question. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for this information. It could not be more on point in terms of what we're trying to achieve here. but. Um, I just had a question about, um, you, you talked about the two packages that could reduce child poverty in half in a decade, and I, I don't know, is it one or the other? I mean, you talked about the annual $3,000 child allowance, so are you saying it, we could just do that and reduce child poverty? In, in half and ten? So, um, so, yeah, so I could, I could be told, so there's two packages, right, of policies and programs that would cut child poverty in half. Um, so the first one um, is what include improvements to the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, uh, the, the child independent care tax credit. Um, uh, it could also include improvements to staff, so increasing right benefit amounts, um, especially for those families with older children who we know eat more, right? Might eat as much as adults, but those families don't get often increased amounts. Um, it would also include um, increases for summer meals um, and kind of expanding some of the pilots we've seen um, around delivering summer meals. Um, it would also include uh, increases to housing vouchers. And so, um, you know, the second one that kind of housing vouchers do would actually increase the amount of housing vouchers so that 70% of families who are eligible for those vouchers, vouchers could receive them. Um, they felt like they couldn't model it to 100, so they thought 70% was pretty good. Um, you know, that's another part where we did a lot of analysis around implementation is key, right? The family has to be able to use that voucher in order for it to be effective. Um, and so we know there's a lot of protections that need to be in place to ensure that a family can use it um, and be able to also stay in that home, right, and, and hold on to that voucher. Um, and so that was another area. Um, and so that, those uh, four things that I mentioned um, would cut child poverty in half as well as deep poverty. Um, and then the second package that would cut child poverty in half would include the child allowance um, that I mentioned, that uh, uh, $3,000 a year. For this one, they actually model it to be $2,700 um, for whatever reason, but pretty close. 
Um, they would also include a child support insurance, so about $100 a month for families who have a child support order. So the idea is, right, that those orders could fluctuate or, you know, custodial parent might not be able to, um, to get the order fully, right, paid due to barriers that non-custodial parent might face. Um, and so at least that child kind of has, again, a floor of resources. Um, um, but that, you know, custodial parent is trying, right, to, to get that order. So um, it's not de-incentivizing child support orders, right? It's kind of just providing a little bit of a cushion. Um, and actually that child support assurance payment, along with a, um, the child allowance, would eliminate deep child poverty in this country, according to their findings. So we thought that's a really... Uh, helpful uh, way to kind of package that. Um, that package would also include the earning income tax credit and the child independent care tax credit. Um, it would include an increase in the minimum wage and it would include um, expanding access to benefits for children and immigrant families. So that last one has kind of the most amount. Um, and so they model, you know, to give you an indication, they model all these packages, right? They look at their costs. They look at the effect on employment and earnings. Um, and the employment and earnings effect, even if they are more negative, don't affect how much child poverty would be reduced. And people have uh, disputed some of those <laughs> earnings um, and employment numbers. Um, you know, you have to definitely look at it in tandem, right? Because if, the earn if it wouldn't affect earnings that much, it usually means, right, it's a minimum wage job that um, maybe mom doesn't have to work that second minimum wage job. Uh, and so, you know, the amount of earnings is, is minimal that would be lost. Um, uh, they also look at, so they look at the effect of these packages on overall child poverty, deep child poverty, as well as 150% of poverty, right, for those families that are just above the poverty line. They also look at the effect of these policy and programs on, um, on how to reduce disparity. So they model it for um, black children, Hispanic children, um, immigrant children, children in single parent households um, as well. They, so there's a lot of meat in here, right, um, which is helpful. Um, I will note that they don't include certain populations in the study, which we um, have talked to them about. They claim that they couldn't model it. So they don't include, for example, this does not include the territories at all. Um, so children of Puerto Rico and other territories are not included even in the base number. Um, they don't include uh, Native American families, um, uh, Asian and Pacific Islanders because um, they claim they couldn't, you know, so those children are included in the base number, but they can't parse out the effects of those children in particular um, given smaller populations. Um, but they do, there are a lot of different ways that they slice this data. Um, again, we have about a 25 page analysis on, you know, on the study that, that models a lot of that um, and includes a lot of charts um, and ways to make it a little more digestible. I didn't want to overwhelm you today with a million slides and all of that, but, um, but that's definitely available. So, uh, so Cara, well, they also look at. Um, Cara, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm I'm, a, I'm cognizant of our time, and we we're going to allow um, our friends uh, from Voices for Vermont Children to give us a little more of a context in Vermont. Um, so, um, so I'm I'm sorry. Can can we bring your portion to to uh, to a close? Yes. No, definitely. Um, so I'll just say that quickly. Um, so this is a chart on the effects for each state, so you can look at um, the effects of Vermont. So I'll just quickly say what we're doing about this, which um, is that uh, First Focus runs what we call the U.S. Child Poverty Action Group, um, which is a partnership of about 20 national organizations. We launched a, um, a campaign um, around the study in February called End Child Poverty U.S., which is to set a national goal to cut child poverty in half. Um, so we, there's national legislation we're working on to do that. We've been doing a ton of activities around the study, um, as well as kind of kind of gaining momentum, like building a network um, to get some good stuff happening. So our website's there at the bottom. We have a listserv, we're on Twitter. Um, and so we'd love to continue to, to work with you guys, be a resource, hear what would be helpful um, from your perspective for us to do. Um, but. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you so much for your time. Sorry, I, I took up a little more of it than intended. No, thank you. It was very interesting and very informative, and um, you know, we appreciate it very much. Great. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, I actually was able to grab the new poverty numbers this morning that were released. Oh, good. So this is the state-level data that you'll see, you know, comparing 
up and down trends in states to each other and things like that. So child poverty in Vermont has decreased. It's 12.1% as of this morning, which is 13,712 kids. And of that, the rate of kids in deep poverty, as Karen was talking about, um, is 5.8%. That's actually not a decrease. So while we've seen kids below the official poverty threshold, with some families um, doing better as the economy improves, and um, we haven't really seen much movement in that deepest poverty category. Um, so basically half of all kids who are in poverty are actually in deep poverty, about 6,500 kids. Um, so the second graph you'll see at the bottom of the line is... I'm sorry, how, how is deep poverty uh, defined? It's half of the poverty ha line. Half of the poverty line, yeah. okay. So, um, in a second, or if you want to now, you can flip to the back of the page. Those thresholds and dollar amounts are actually at this top table here, which is a partial table of different family compositions and the dollar amounts that reflect what the official poverty line is. And so you'll see in gray at the top, the single parent poverty line is $17,308, and the two parent, two child poverty line is $25,000. So when we're talking about that 12.1%, we're talking about 12.1% of kids being below these dollar amounts according to what their family looks like. Um, and in contrast, right below that, you'll see Vermont's basic need budget amounts and how much higher those are for those same family positions. Um, and flipping back to the, to the front, these, this line graph at the bottom reflects different levels of poverty the lowest 50% of poverty, that's deep poverty. I just wanted you to have actual numbers of kids and percentages of how many kids fall into these different categories. And this 300% we like to use as um, sort of equivalent to what an actual sort of self-sufficiency amount or basic needs budget amount might would look like. There's no real exact cross-reference between those two things, but it's about, it's about that many kids. Can I, yes. Give me a profile. What, what is life like at deep poverty? Are we talking about living in a motel or? Yeah, you know, it could be. Rock and roll, it, or I mean, what, what is? It, it, I mean, if you are thinking about the, so say you're a single parent with one child, and 100% of poverty is seventeen thousand dollars of cash income a year, you'd be looking at half that amount to live off. And so this is where those safety net programs are. First of all, absolutely critical, and we know fully inadequate, really, to like actually get you to a standard where you can have, you know, any kind of sustainable uh, lifestyle. I mean, it sounds to me like living in the car. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you know, what it, whatever you could do. I just want to point out that I don't think it's just living in a car because there are a number of people who are renting or who are doubled up who would fall into that category as well. Yeah. And so without, without the safety net, without TANF, without housing support, without SNAP, like, to live off half of, you know, to live off that amount of money, right? Um, and so at the last table I gave you is just the top five expenses according to Vermont's basic needs budget and those four amounts. And if you look at them, um, you kind of realize that there's actually, we know there's not actually adequate safety net support for most of those categories, right? Like housing is lacking, child care, health care, transportation. So these are just things that we you know like are not flexible expenses, are necessary expenses. And for, for most people, so for 53,000 kids or in families that are going to require some help with some of these categories. So I, uh, I'm not going to read my full memo, uh, but I just want to pull out some highlights. Um, so I think one of the things that drew me to the work of First Focus and the, the End Child Poverty U.S. campaign was it, it you know, the, the data and the research came out right as we were in the middle of the legislative session, kind of uh, weighing the merits of different approaches, different policy. Um, uh, suggestions to address child poverty and child well-being, and it felt a little like rather than arguing which which policy is going to be the best, we should actually be looking in a more holistic way about a package of policies that'll move um, child well-being forward. 
and um, and so the policies that are modeled in the NAS report are federal level policies. They do also have, um, there's so much, uh, so many kind of ways to access that data and there's models that look at how each of the four, there were actually told four packages that they modeled, how it would impact child poverty in Vermont. Um, so you can see how when you overlay those federal policies on our own policies, what impact it would have. Um, but the, we know that things are moving very slowly at the federal level. We can't expect those policies to change very quickly. So I'm really interested in um, putting together a suite of policies that are really specific to Vermont so that would build upon what we're already doing well in Vermont and the gaps that we know it ex that exist. Um, and to really look at disaggregating our data in a way so that we target, you know, if, we target the, the um, interventions on the specific geographies or other kind of disaggregated groups that um, that need more support. So um, let's see. So the three the kind of three sections, the three groupings of uh, of policy interventions that came out of the NAS report are work supports. Um, means tested benefits and then universal supports, which I think um, Kara gave a lot of great examples of what that would look like. Mm -hmm. So uh, in work supports, um, you know, EITC Vermont's already highest in the country with our add-on for EITC, but one example of how we could disaggregate the Vermont experience and then make an adjustment to our policy that would really help um, folks that are most impacted by poverty if you, uh, Kara said that children experience poverty at a higher rate than adults, and that's absolutely true. When you break down even smaller groups, you find out that kind of those young adults who are still adolescents, those 18 to 24 year olds, experience poverty at the highest rates. So that demographic um, is experiencing the most poverty. And so we know that's also the population that is most likely, most likely to be in minimum wage jobs. It's also the population that is not um, eligible for EITC. And so you could, we could do something, other states are doing this, where you make EITC eligibility expand down to 18 so that those young, low-income workers could access that benefit, which is one of the best tools to end poverty. Um, let's see, so that's that example. Um, means tested ben benefits. So, as Kara said, TANF is a little tough because you know we obviously have been fighting for increases to reach up uh, base grants, and we will continue to do so. But the way that TANF uh, is executed in different states means it's very, it looks very different in how effective it is. We think we could still make Vermont's TANF program more effective, um, and we're exploring a couple different ways to do that. One is. Colorado has passed a, um, I think 2015 passed, uh, changed their, their rules so that child support payments that are made to um, custodial parents who are in their TANF program fully pass through. So most states use child support payments, most of child support payments to offset the cost of benefits to, to families and so that basically repaying the reach up or the TANF grants. Um, Colorado stopped doing that. Uh, with some, there's some cap, like if, you, if you're getting more than $500 a month over six months, then they might start capping it. But, um, and it drastically improved the resources going into families. It also had some unexpected benefits of increasing the overall participation and uh, payment rate for child support payments. And so people, parents were kind of like, oh, this money's actually going to my kids. I feel more excited about paying it. Um, and uh, and improve some of that family, those family relationships. So there's a lot of good things that could come out of these kind of small tweaks to our programs. We, we did increase reach up base we this did. year, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. Yep, about a 10% increase. And so, yeah, yes. I want so to thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Say, we did a little bit. We did. We did. Yeah. <laughs> And as with the child um, child care financial assistance program, we acknowledge that those were you know important increases. And oh my gosh, the total the, the goal line is still quite a ways out, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's see. What else do I want to say really quickly? Oh snap! You know, I think the other piece is in terms of the relationship between Vermont policy and federal policy is um, you know with the the rule change that's under consideration right now from the feds uh, around SNAP means seven million dollars in resources. Uh, leaving our, our nutrition program. And so we would just really 
uh, strongly urge the legislature to be prepared to backfill those because as you saw in the presentation, SNAP is one of the most important anti-poverty programs for families with young children. Um, the universal supports, this is an area I'm most excited about and I think as we think about Reach out and other programs that have that have requirements and, and that actually require families to come into almost a surveillance relationship with the state. That um, there's really growing a growing body of knowledge and research that shows that just giving people cash is the best solution. And it feels hard, I think, for policymakers to think to do, to do that because it feels like they should earn it, they should have some skin in the game. But um, but in fact, what you see with basic needs um, or basic income measures is that when families have that slack, when they're not spending so much time like tuck and roll or going from food shelf to food shelf, when they're actually able to meet their basic needs, amazing things happen in terms of employment and entrepreneurialism and child well-being. And so I think moving ourselves away from this kind of sense that, um, that you have to like earn the right to have your basic needs met um, would really improve the lives of children in Vermont. So we feel like this kind of work, any kind of a, um, a coordinated campaign like this requires ongoing, consistent conversation and work that the, the structure of this committee um, is somewhat limited and that you only meet in the fall and um, uh, for short periods of time. And so we're, we're really eager to create an ongoing body that would, uh, you know, a coalition that would basically be a coalition of coalitions because there are groups already working on minimum wage and family leave and other things. So bring us all together, figure out how we can um, be moving all of these issues forward rather than sort of pushing one at a time. Um, and we'd love to figure out ways for the council to, to bridge with that work, um, including, I think I mentioned in the memo, and I've talked to Representative Lanford before about having a child and family caucus that where these issues could be alive during the session and we could kind of keep, hold each other accountable for the goals that we have. Um, I think that's, that's basically, oh, and then just, we have a, a, a conference that Kara's gonna be speaking at on November 6th, so save the date, we'll be more about, more about this, and hopefully by then we'll have a better sense of what, um, what this campaign will, will include in terms of policies. Thank you very much. Great. All right, thank you, I'm sorry to, yeah. thank you for <laughs> through, but do we have any other uh, questions? Yeah. I don't have a question, I just wanna say, I really loved the information you gave today, and the fact that you said people shouldn't have to earn the right to have their basic needs met. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really powerful, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you? I was just. What was the date? Did you give November sixth? November sixth. November sixth. Yes, sir. Uh, help. I, I have to deal with constituents, and um, the, I've read that there's a proverb in India that the poor hate the poor. I get angry, angry complaints from my constituents about, in particular, the suggestion that that we just give people cash, which the good sense of which I can see. But how do I answer them? Because it could be, the perception is that, that, that people are going to mis, misspend. That they're going to, the stereotype is going to use the cash to buy beer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think one of the things is that uh, we keep circling people around to the fact that these are programs for children, and that, that if you, um, and well, there's actually a fair amount of evidence, which maybe I can put together some talking points that when people are given cash, they're not buying beer, mm -hmm. they're, they're paying back rent, they're buying clothes for their kids to go to school, and so I think combating misconception with fact is probably a good place to start. And then, you know, sure, there's always gonna be bad seeds, right? I mean, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, we don't wanna make those, those exceptions the norm, right? Mm -hmm. and, that happens, there's corporate bad seeds, there's you know, law enforcement bad seeds, and so none of those, those um, entities want to be defined by the very small number of people in their midst who are, who are kind of going against the norm, but. If you can just get us that information, yeah. I, I would appreciate it. Yeah, because there are pilots and research now and yeah. longer term studies that have demonstrated. Sure. One more question. I, I see nothing in here about education. Okay. I mean, we need to 
somehow educate our adult population um, so that it passes down to their children. Um, I know that we have issues with 3K and some of our needy children are not getting that. So how do we how do we address educating parents of these poverty stricken children? How do we do this? Can I? I thought it was really um, interesting what Kara said about the two generation advantages is, and that they weren't able to model the things like that would address the needs of the parents for learning their own education, for example. Um, in, in this particular study, but that, that might be more something that, as a Vermont specific package, what we pay a lot of attention to is two generation strategies or multi generation strategies for uh, an overall, mm -hmm. right, an overall lift mm -hmm. of everybody. It would be interesting to see if there would be any effect on children mm -hmm. if we had some kind of parental placement of education. Yes. I I'd, I'd also like to caution us in thinking about you know placing a group of uh, people who are poor or struggling some way as if they don't um, they aren't educated or they don't care about their children's education. It's, there's plenty of research and study that shows that it's actually the opposite of what we what we hold as kind of a. Um, we just hold that as a society that somehow poor folks don't care, they, they, um, they don't care about their kids or about education, and it's, it's really not true. So I think if we could re, um, you know, think about this differently and actually talk about what, what's actually going on for families um, and, and around education in particular, I think we would really be surprised. Um, it's real, it really is a um, stereotype. Do you think it's a, it would be possible to see an increase in accessing education for parents or adults if they were able to have their basic needs met? So they would be able to maybe qualify for funding or access different funding or have the time to, to actually participate in a class when they're not going from food shelf to food shelf, or in IEP meetings, or at the economic service office, checking in every week or month or whatever. Yeah, I think mean, there's data to support that that's what happens when you reduce that, um, that load, that kind of mental load from people's lives, that it creates space to do exactly that. Yeah. Well, that's why I also heard the report asking about, like, what's it like? So just thinking about, there's a lot of great data here, but Stories. Having some case yeah. studies, yes. just because everyone has someone in their mind, mm -hmm. either real or fictitious, that you go, well, but you know. So yeah. it's nice to have something concrete yes. to. Definitely, we're working on it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Good morning. This is Travis Poulin. Hi, Travis. This is Debbie Ingram um, in Montpelier with the. Uh, Whole, uh, property Council here, and sorry that we're running late and kept you waiting. No worries. But thank you for um, testifying before us in this manner, and um, I'll just go ahead and let you get started. All righty. Um, being a relative newbie at giving actual testimony, I'll uh, read off some information about the VITA program. And certainly, if anyone has questions, I can answer them at the end, or you can just yelp out and interrupt me, and I'll answer them as we go. Um, I'm going to start as though you do not have any information on what VITA is. I will give you just a brief background. VITA stands for the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. This is free tax preparation offered to moderate and low-income households with earned income uh, throughout Vermont. CVOEO, my agency, the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, one of the five CAP agencies that provide services throughout the state of Vermont, is the lead agency for this IRS matching funds grant. Every year, um, luckily now every two years, since the IRS made it a um, every two year grant, we submit uh, an extensive application to the IRS 
to participate in this VITA matching funds grant. It's called a matching funds grant because the IRS requires that you show that you have matching funds for the money that you are asking for. Now those matching funds are provided um, via the value of volunteer hours. So for instance, this past tax season, across the state of Vermont through the community action programs, 128 volunteers provided 4,560 hours of service valued based on the Vermont median hourly wage for tax preparation as listed on the website for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, those hours were valued at $102,000. The IRS grant is a $54,000 grant. Uh, sometimes a little less, uh, hopefully this year a little more. Um, but in general, it's, a, it's been between a $49,000 and a $54,000 grant with some fluctuation over the years. So the five community action agencies do have a long history of providing free tax preparation. CBOEO has had a tax preparation service in place since 1980. Capstone has offered their VITA program to clients since 1999. The Northeast Kingdom Community Action has been coordinating and operating a return service since 19, uh, 1995. SEVGA began offering free tax preparation in 1994, and Brock has had an official VITA site since 2008. Altogether, the VITA program itself actually just celebrated its 50th anniversary this year, um, or as they stated on a plaque that the IRS sent us this year, one tax season at a time since 1969. <laughs> um, it's awfully pretty plaque, yeah, we were thrilled to get it. Um, <laughs> So that's the VITA program in a nutshell. It is funding through, well, I should say the VITA program is volunteer income tax assistance preparation, free tax preparation for households who meet VITA criteria, which in general is households that make $55,000 or less in the year and who um, works in the state of Vermont. So for instance, if someone worked in New Hampshire and in Vermont, they would be considered out of scope, meaning that the volunteers who are actually doing the taxes were not trained and certified to do other states' income tax returns. They're only trained on Vermont income tax returns and federal income tax returns. If it's out of scope, we're not supposed to be able to assist. The VITA grant does not actually provide funding to pay someone to prepare taxes. It provides funding that is used by the community action agencies primarily to hire VITA site coordinators who train and supervise volunteers who actually do the tax preparation. Um, um, also, some of the agencies use the money for um, the basic office stuff, mailing stamps, ink for the printer cartridges, because everyone who gets their taxes done leaves with a copy of their tax return. Uh, the volunteers need to pass an open book online test in order to be certified by the IRS as qualified tax preparers, and the site coordinators who also have to pass an IRS certification process at an advanced level are the final eyes on all of those completed tax returns before they are submitted electronically. So in general, every tax return has at least three sets of eyes on it before it is submitted, not counting the actual tax, the actual uh, applicant themselves, who are there, of course, while the taxes are being prepared and who have to agree that everything is correct and accurate before we go ahead and submit. 99% of all VITA returns are completed and submitted electronically. Really, the only reason that we might not submit a tax return electronically is when we know from the initial conversation with someone that they, for instance, might be asking us to help them file a previous year's tax return or an amended tax return, which has to be sent in um, by paper. Both federal and state of Vermont income tax returns are completed. Each community action agency. Travis, Travis, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that information. 
So, of course, you know, we're the Child Poverty Council. Um, yep. So could you maybe say a little bit more about how uh, this, this particular program helps um, maybe lift people out of poverty? Does it help them to, um, do you help them, you know, make sure that they're aware of the Earned Income Tax Credit Program, for instance? Oh, yeah. Or do you help oh, yeah. them qualify for yeah. other programs? I mean, could you speak about that a little bit? Absolutely. I'm going to skip on my notes down to the 2019 outcomes since you brought up earned income tax credit. We know, I don't have language in front of me, I wish I did. We know that the earned income tax credit is um, a fantastic mechanism for helping lift people out of poverty. Uh, last year, um, the Vermont Vita Coalition helped prepare 4,538 state income tax returns and 4,595 federal returns, which included 743 returns that were actually completed without uh, the volunteers being involved via the My Free Taxes program. It resulted in uh, over $460,000 in child tax credits over $700,000 in additional child tax credits, uh, $1,800,000 in earned income tax credits, uh, $73,000 in education credits for a total of over $3 million in tax credits, plus, of course, over $5 million in refunds for a total value of over $8 million in refunds and credits. Now, in addition to just, you know, here's your cash, um, in addition to actually preparing the tax returns, what these outcomes do not show, uh, in addition to providing the assistance with federal and state income tax returns, the community action agencies also help complete Vermont homestead declarations and renter rebate forms. Because these forms don't count, if you will, to meet the minimum returns required by the IRS, um, as they are only concerned with federal income tax returns, Many of the households who need help completing these two state forms are on fixed limited income, social security, disability, and may not have any earned income to report. The data itself also does not speak to the true service provided to VITA clients. In addition to actually helping them prepare their tax forms, thereby saving these families hundreds of dollars each in tax preparation fees, um, the community action agencies display information on and facilitate referrals to their individual financial capability and education services. Here at CBOEO, that's called Financial Futures, Growing Money. Um, Jillian offers a series of amazing educational classes on credit, on handling money, on understanding it and working with it. We screen clients for participation in supportive services, such as Three Squares of Vermont. We schedule follow-up appointments for those households who are not receiving those benefits and want help applying. Really, by the very fact that the VITA sites are primarily run by community action agencies, the folks who come in to get their taxes done also have access to staff on site who are familiar with fuel utility resources, food shelves, and other services to help them meet their basic needs. So, yes, absolutely, I would say there is a strong advocacy and um, information and referral aspect of the VITA program um, to help help people lift out of poverty, to help keep them stable as much as possible and safe in their homes. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Thank you, Travis. Yeah. One other uh, question, so, one other yeah, question go, I have go, is... Go for the other question. Okay, how, how do you um, make uh, people aware that, that you offer this uh, service? <laughs> um, <laughs> we do, uh, uh, we definitely conduct outreach. We um, post on Front Porch Forum, which constantly amazes me how many people read Front Porch Forum throughout the state. <laughs> Uh, front Porch Forum, and then Joan, our development director, just walked by my office. Um, Twitter, Joan handles these things. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I am, I am not the person to talk to about social media, but I know that we advertise our services on all of those. Of course, our website. And in Chittenden County, uh, well, actually, throughout the state, we also work with Vermont 211. Uh, which, as you, I'm sure you are already aware, is a fantastic hub of information and referral services. Not only do they know about our program so they can refer people to us in Chittenden County, um, Chittenden Community Action a Program of CDOEO runs the single largest VITA site in the state of Vermont. 27% of all VITA returns are done last year here at this Burlington site. Um, 211 actually schedules all of our tax appointments. 
our Vita site coordinator working with community volunteers and college volunteers um, creates a Google Calendar that we provide access to for uh, Vermont 211. People call 211 to schedule the appointments. They fill in the Google Calendar. They also remind them of when their appointment is going to be and review what is necessary for them to bring into their appointment to help get them as prepared as possible. So we definitely do outreach uh, um, in the past. I've actually gone on Channel 17 to advertise this service. Really, though, in Chittenden County, it is word of mouth. We have many, many, many repeat customers who, once they get their taxes done for free here and realize the level of service and the quality of service, thank you very much with a 98% accuracy rate, the highest ever in Vita history. Um, and by the way, that's Vita history nationwide. <laughs> um, they just want to keep coming back. Yes. Um, because, you know, we try very hard. It gets extremely busy, and you always worry that something is going to get lost in the chaos, but we, it's a managed chaos. We try very hard not only to provide an amazing service in terms of getting your taxes done accurately, timely, uh, but it's, we're a community action agency. We're CBOEO. We want people to feel welcome here. We want them to feel comfortable here. We want to allay their concerns, which is why we work so hard with the New American population. We work with refugee resettlement and AALV and telephonic interpretation services. Um, in fact, AALV, Association of Africans Living in Vermont, and the Refugee Resettlement Program both work with us to schedule blocks of time, entire days, where they themselves schedule the tax appointments and then come in with clients who are um, new Americans, non-English speakers, or English as a second language, certainly, and help provide interpretation services on site. It's been a very, it's been a wonderful model. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. So we have some other questions. If I'm yeah. Hi, Travis. This is Karen. Um, hey. How are you? Um, I am well. You, thank you. Could you just speak to... Um, I know that this program is, is run on a shoestring and you get federal money, but we don't get any state money and it is heavily subsidized. Could you just talk to um, uh, the availability? I mean, are there people who want to, uh, to have this program that you can't serve? Or um, oh, yeah. I know in so, some places, go yeah. ahead. Um, let me do a special note of appreciation and I can forward my little notes that I've been typing up prior to this conversation. I'm gonna do two special notes of appreciation. For this past tax season, the state of Vermont actually provided the five community action agencies $15,000 each as a VITA expansion grant, supporting our tax preparation efforts and encouraging the expansion and growth of these services. These funds were extremely helpful, particularly for the Northeast Kingdom Community Action Agency, which has long struggled to have the resources necessary, including people resources, including volunteers, to revitalize their tax preparation program. NECA actually pulled out of the Vermont Coalition and did not offer any tax preparation services two years ago. Um, they have a new executive director, and this last year they did do taxes again. Um, but these funds from the state were extremely helpful, more than helpful really. They were necessary for NECA to sort of get back on its feet in terms of tax preparation services. Across the state, the funds were used to purchase new laptops, printers, and scanners by some of the agencies because changing tax preparation software, which is mandated for us to use by the IRS, the software is called TaxFlare. Um, our, some of our aging computers meant that agencies were actually losing their technical capacity to run the program. They couldn't run the software. So this created a nice infrastructure, some foundation for a lot of agencies to get back on top of the software and the technical requirements of running this program. They were also used, the funding was also used to expand hours of service at some agencies and to provide staff the opportunity to receive advanced tax training, which will not only help them last year when they were preparing taxes, but that kind of training for staff helps them throughout the year when they're working with people through their financial capacity services. Mm -hmm. I also want to note a special note of appreciation myself locally for CEDO, the Burlington Community Economic Development Office. Um, as I previously mentioned, we run the single largest VITA site in the state of Vermont in any given year. Over half of the VITA participants um, at this site are Burlington residents. And CEDO provides us grant funding. Um, we've only missed one year since I started working here that we were not able to get that grant funding. They provide us grant funding to help 
uh, bolster and support our tax services. And quite frankly, without that CEDAW money, we would not be able to offer the evening and weekend hours that Community Action here in Burlington offers. We prepare taxes uh, from 8 in the morning until 5 o'clock at night, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. We offer evening hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we prepare taxes on Saturdays throughout the tax season. And uh, that is in large part because we're able to get CEDAW funds to bolster the IRS matching grant money. You are absolutely correct. Running this program is abysmal. <laughs> the, the, the VITA program requires an intense amount of paperwork to keep up with the requirements of the IRS matching funds grant. It requires intense oversight. You, you really, I mean, community action agencies are very respectful of confidentiality. We really try hard to be honest and direct with people, and we understand the details that are necessary to be involved with housing services, fuel and utility, all of that. This VITA program takes it to another level where we're extremely conscientious of working with people, respecting their confidentiality, protecting their confidentiality with all of that sensitive data that we're getting. It requires enormous amounts of oversight. I was on a recent conference call, a statewide one, where there was a gentleman speaking from Massachusetts, and Massachusetts has an amazing tax program. And he said, what people don't realize is that this is effectively like starting a small business every year where you start from the ground up, you have to revitalize, get more volunteers in, organize their hours, monitor their timesheets and activity logs, which all have to be provided back to the IRS. Um, it's an enormous amount of work, and then you shut down your program six to seven months later, and you start all over again the next year. Um, so yeah, it, is, it does operate on a shoestring, a $54,000 federal grant, by far does not cover the cost of running this program. Agencies are using individual donations, uh, CSBG dollars to try to fill the gaps. Um, and as I said, it, it, it's really this, this multi-legged stool if you're gonna have a successful program. You have to have volunteers available to do the taxes. And those volunteers have to be willing to give up a certain amount of their life during that two and a half months of the tax season and just prior in order to get certified. Uh, you have to have the infrastructure necessary. You need physical space in order to see people. You have to have the software up and running. Um, you have to have a good Wi-Fi connection. Uh, you've got to pay attention. You've got to have the administrative time to make certain that all of that paperwork is getting done. And that all, that all costs money. Um, so yes, are there people that want to get their taxes done that we're not able to assist? I would say absolutely. Here in Shindon, which is the area I can speak to the best, here at our office, um, we get front-loaded, if you will. The calls come so fast and furious just before the tax season begins. And at the beginning of the tax season, if people aren't able to get a tax appointment with us within the first month and a half, they start to get frustrated or scared. And um, we know that we have people that opt to go to H&R Block or another paid tax repairer, and they end up spending a couple hundred dollars to get their taxes done because they're worried they won't be able to get in to see us in time because all of those appointments have been filled in so quickly in the first few weeks um, will be scheduled for a month out easily. Um, and uh, that's, that's always scary, that's always frustrating because these are not taxes that are generally hard to do. Travis, Travis, yeah. we have a couple of other uh, questions in limited Sorry. time, so I'm just going to pass along. Um, so, uh, Representative Cooperley. Uh, Travis, Representative Cooperley from Rutland City. Um, do you, hi. Hi, how are you? Do you do, well. any, uh, do, you do any work with uh, the Bennington Rutland Opportunity Council? Oh, yes. Um, the Brock is one of the five community action agencies that participates in the VITA grant. Um, and doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. So, I mean, the simple answer to your question is absolutely. Brock is one of the participants. They do offer tax preparation services. SEPCA, Brock, NECA, Capstone, and CBOEO. Also a member of the VITA coalition up here in our area is the United Way of Northwest Vermont. Um, they do run a VITA site, although they do not take any money out of the VITA matching grant program. Um, they provide their data to Community Action so that we can utilize their numbers to meet our minimum requirements. They simply do not take any money out of the grant, which is frankly amazing, and we work with them extremely closely. Um, I can actually pull up rock data if you were interested, but I know we are on limited time. We are. Yeah, um, we have a, yeah. yeah thanks. Uh, but you may absolutely participate. Oh, yes. Thank you. Great. Okay. See anything? 
Hi, Travis. This is Sandy Peretz. Um, I'm from Vermont Legal Aid. I just thought this would be a good time to just mention to everyone that we have a low-income taxpayer clinic. So if you have constituents who have controversies with the IRS, and it, it is an IRS grant, and it's a matching grant, so we also struggle. We have to get volunteers <laughs> to help. But we do it because it is such an important anti-poverty measure. So um, absolutely, we, and we advertise your tax clinic. Yeah, so we, we do. We partner a lot with Vita, and we do a lot of education and outreach, especially into new American communities. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and that's eight point four question. million dollars into the hands of low-income people. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's an amazing remarkable. figure. It is. It is. It yeah. Is. So Representative Lambert. Thank, thank you, Travis. Uh, Diane Lambert here. I was just wondering, you know, because we think, oh, how come people don't know about it? But then you book up solid. Yeah. So we don't want to market to something that's just frustrating at the same time. Um, but That's always a fine line for us to walk. It absolutely is. I want to advertise. I want people to know about it. And yet we, here in Burlington, we book up very quickly. What's the earliest somebody can schedule with you? I believe, I'll have to double check with um, the Vermont 211, but I believe that they begin scheduling the last week of January. It's always a, it's always a um, sudden rush to the finish line, if you will, because half of our volunteers here in Chittenden are college students. So we have to wait for the college students to come back from winter break, be available. We schedule an actual in-person three-day training at Champlain College. They donate the space. And we invite all of our volunteers to attend this training in class for two and a half days, and then the last half of the I, third day is. Travis, I don't um, mean to stop you, yeah, but I know we're no, running out of time. I mean, yeah. what time? Not just when they can start to prepare the taxes. When can I call your office to schedule my appointment? Oh, I, it's usually the it's usually people can call two one one starting in the last week of January, and we begin preparing taxes February first. All right, so it's it's a it is a okay. You can't call in November and start to get the schedule. No, because we don't know what the students' schedules are. Yeah. We have to get the students back, train them, look at their availability, organize our our Google Calendar based on their availability, and then advertise that to two one one, who then can fill it in. Okay, we get. All right, wait, we have one more one, question. One quick one. This is uh, Teresa Wood. Travis, I'm just wondering, I know that um, RSVP also does free tax um, services for people. Do you coordinate with them, make referrals to them if you're full? Um, yes, to some degree. It's the, the eligibility criteria for TCE or tax credit for the elderly is slightly different than VITA. Um, so we do communicate back and forth, but they are subtly different programs. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you so much. Sorry to no, rush no, you, but uh, we, we, seem, okay. we seem to always be behind schedule. So. And uh, just, just, uh, just one last thing. Um, this is a rough number, uh, but on average, um, according to accountants or us or something like that, um, on average, the cost of preparing basic federal and state income tax forms in Vermont, if you go to a paid preparer, is between like 180 and 200 dollars to do all the, the basic forms, which means that we saved Vermonters over $900,000. Um, if you take the number of tax returns we prepared times, say, $200 for an average cost, that's also money that they saved out of pocket. Yeah, that's that's remarkable. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a lovely day. Appreciate it. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Travis. So if you could just tell us your name and Position. Sure. Go right ahead. Sure. Uh, so I'm Dylan Giamatisa. I'm the Director of Outreach and Financial Literacy for the Treasurer's Office. Um, and I get to take a leave every so often to come here in the legislature and serve in the House Education Committee. Um, so really excited to talk to you today about uh, financial literacy initiatives in the state. Be happy to take any questions. Um, I can go through a presentation if you'd like. Uh, I, I, when I'm wearing my bureaucratic hat, I try not to be too bureaucratic. So I'll try to play here nice and make it interesting for you. Um, and I'll try to be as quick as possible. So depending on your time limitations, feel free to speed me up or slow me down or do whatever you need. Um, so in short, the Treasurer's Office has a pretty robust uh, focus on financial literacy. Um, and this goes back many years to around 2007, around the time of the financial crisis, uh, there was a growing awareness uh, nationally and at the state level uh, that there was some need to take a look at what was going on uh, with people's personal finances. And that, of course, was just highlighted when the Great Recession occurred. Uh, people, uh, the issues not only of 
saving for retirement, but also preparing for the future rainy day funds um, and financial emergency were pushed to the forefront. And the treasurer's office at that time, around that time, 2007, um, hired a full-time staff. My duties are split not only between financial literacy outreach work and education work that we do, um, I also manage variety of outreach uh, work in unclaimed property and other office functions. So it's a busy, it's a busy schedule. The treasurer likes to do a lot of things. Treasurer Pierce has been a real advocate um, in this area. And what we have done is we've tried to go where there is need to identify uh, issues. Um, and so we've had this three-pronged approach of advocacy, collaboration, and development. Um, we don't like to step on the toes of all the great work that's going on in the community. Uh, I think anyone who works at the community level, be it CDOEO or you know, Travis's work or, or otherwise, um, they have a first-hand perspective, and they're essentially addressing uh, poverty firsthand and providing services for those in, needs, uh, in need. We, we've tried to identify what we can do with limited resources um, that would have an impact and so we've tried to develop partnerships to do so. Um, but really broadly, this term financial literacy, I just want to say real quick that you know, I sometimes scratch my head when I hear it because I had someone point out to me yesterday, a pretty uh, thoughtful community stakeholder, well, financial literacy, if you don't have the skills, it means you're illiterate in this area. And I think that this is a sensitivity that we really need to be aware of. Uh, last thing I want to do is make anyone feel like uh, because they might not have full knowledge of how uh, an investment works, a Roth IRA, whatever it may be, that they're illiterate. That's not it at all. Um, I think what the, the core idea here has been, has been, well, let's help people achieve financial well-being, which is essentially, once you've mastered the concepts, you put them to work in your life, and you try to achieve good outcomes for folks. Um, so this is just something I'm sensitive to. In statute, it is defined as financial literacy. We've had a financial literacy commission. We have a financial literacy trust fund that the treasurer's office operates that allows us to fundraise money and distribute funds for programs that we create. Um, and it's just, it's an interesting piece that I thought this group might find interesting that, that we certainly need to be aware of as we move forward. Um, I did throw in some information here. Uh, over the last several years, the treasurer's office, the state treasurer, along with uh, some other members, had a financial literacy commission. Um, it was set to sunset and did sunset in uh, 2018. Um, and so we actually, I pulled together some of the data here from a report that they issued at that time uh, that, that highlights some of the issues that we see in different broad categories. At the time, the financial literacy commission set out to do its work looking at K-12 education uh, post-secondary education and adult financial literacy needs. Um, but the one that I really want to draw attention to is in the third slide here in the PDF, is um, this top line that only 22% of Vermonters have participated in financial education in school, college, or at work. Uh, this is data, I believe this one, I don't have citations because it's in the report, so I've sort of referenced that at the top. I believe it comes from a FINRA survey. They take a look at um, all these metrics gauging financial well-being um, and a variety of questions. And so they arrived at this conclusion through a very robust data collection effort that they do periodically. Um, what that tells us is that uh, perhaps it's that there isn't an understanding of the importance of financial education. Perhaps there hasn't been um, the wraparound services that we need. Um, but in Vermont, we've looked to address that. So the Financial Literacy Commission actually made a series of recommendations about what we could do one of which was taking a look at our K-12 education system to update financial education standards. So there has been progress there. The State Board of Education in February 2018 adopted the Jumpstart Financial Literacy Education Standards. Um, in practice, that means that right now, thanks to the work of a variety of stakeholders in our agency of education, they're working to develop um, pieces that will be compatible with Vermont's very uh, local control-centric education system. So proficiency-based grading requirements, personalized learning plans, they're putting together models uh, that can be used in the field. And I bring this up because when we started our work in 20, 2007, there wasn't that type of architecture in the public school system. I think it's fair to say that um, you had educators who felt compelled to address this topic based upon experiences they saw in their community. Uh, pockets of need, or perhaps just an interest. So it might be a business education teacher, it might be a, a social studies teacher who wants to teach about economics. Um, it's really the educators and administrators who at the local level have driven financial education that kids receive. Um, and so I brought that up, and I'm going to focus a little bit on K-12 education, and I'm happy to revisit any of this. There's a lot of good information in here, but I know our time is limited. Um, 
But I'm going to focus on that because a lot of our programs currently are focused in our schools, um, but also outside of our schools. So just real quick, a quick um, sense of the programming the Treasurer's Office has done over the years. We've had a variety of initiatives. We've done everything from the Money Smart Child Initiative, which was a partnership with People's United Bank, whereby we printed uh, about 11,000 materials, which were guides that were sent to schools in the state, um, that were distributed to parents so that they could talk with their children about financial literacy. This is the whole idea that if you train the trainer, provide the resources to the parents, or have a two-gen approach, you'll be able to um, immerse people in some of this knowledge. You know, we've done other things as well. There was a guard deployment, um, and in fact, right now, it would appear that we're up for a deployment coming up in 2021. Um, so we've worked on programming with our National Guard to ensure that our families have information as they prepare for what is a pretty significant, significant financial change in their life. Uh, deployment can, can lead to significant changes in income and other things. Um, so I've already reached out to the Guard about hoping to put together a program, and so we're going to be looking to coordinate with them over the coming months. Um, we've held games and contests for uh, high school age students, such as the Vermont Treasury Cup Challenge, which is an annual, um, I'll call it, this isn't really correct, and I would get beat up by the students if I said this, it's kind of a Jeopardy style competition uh, that we hold, very competitive, and we do it uh, with, in partnership with uh, banks, credit unions, um, and also BSAC, who's helped us out there. So that is for a high school age population. We've done poster contests across the school age, uh, populations to try to get some interest and without announcing it too early we're working on a collaboration with the Vermont Jumpstart Coalition right now to update that into a video contest that we hope might turn into some PSAs you'll see on TV. Um, we do numerous training seminars, outreach events, um, we have partnerships with groups like CBOEO and they do something like that. They, they held annually a uh, financial wellness day event in Winooski each year. Uh, we've been partners in doing that work, convening it, setting it up, and making sure it's successful. Uh, additionally, we've been, we partnered with organizations that we've had task force, state sanctioned commissions, um, and now we actually have a working group within government that's thinking about financial education and where we go from here. So that's just a quick snapshot. How am I doing on time here? Getting through? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Yeah, if we could probably be done by about 20 after oh, yeah. the That's perfect. <laughs> and I've had so much coffee today, I can do it in <laughs> one day. <laughs> um, but really, I want to talk a little bit about our youth financial literacy programs. Um, this is, a, I would call it, the cornerstone of the activities of the treasurer's office. Uh, we, of course, are not educators. We are spreadsheet geeks, I think it's fair to say. We like to think about cash management, debt management, unclaimed property, retirement security, things of that nature. Um, but when it comes to working with our schools, we recognized about a decade ago um, that we could look at approaches of other states and think about, well, how can we get some of this curriculum and these concepts into the hands of educators and the kids? And so what we did was we worked on developing a program that we called Reading as an Investment, um, and we annually develop original curriculum um, that we bundle up. We work uh, with partners. Uh, to raise money into our financial literacy trust fund and then distribute uh, the resources that we purchase with those funds to schools around the state. And we're trying to uh, provide kids at an early age with the concepts of entrepreneurship, budgeting, saving, investing, and other concepts. Um, I almost brought a book with me today from this year's program that's about squirrels gathering for the winter um, <laughs> to just demonstrate that this, you know, we're not going in there and expecting kids to know uh, what their 401k is, we're going in and trying to get them concepts that uh, educators who are really the highly trained professionals can, can link in a way that's meaningful to the students. Um, this has been a great program, and I just want to point out that this is not a mandated program. We have no mandate whatsoever to provide these programs. We do it because we realize there was a need. And in this case, with our K-6 educators, um, flexibility is key. You know, uh, I've wondered how this program would fare over the last several years of schools merging. And I was concerned that we might see a decrease in available educator time because we work with librarians. And we all know that when resources are tight, there are some positions that are harder to hang on to in schools. But what I've seen, actually, is it seems pretty steady at about 140 of our schools all around the state. We even have Essex County, because we have Lunenburg and Gilman up there. Um, and what we've seen is that 140 schools, it's the educators who have the interest in driving it, or it's an administrator who believes that financial education is important. 
So it's really it's a testament to the teachers who deliver this material that it is as successful as it is. And with the advent of financial literacy education standards, we're also looking at other areas like after school, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, jumping ahead here to the next slide, this K-6 program, um, it's built around three books. We send them out each year. VSAT provides 20 college savings accounts that allow us to incentivize participation with the kids. They do a certain amount of reading requirements of uh, financial education books, and then they're entered into our contest. So last year, this voluntary program, um, we're very pleased. We had 5,688 students in the last school year participate and complete the requirements of the program. Um, that's the highest number we've ever had over the years. We, we saw a spike at one point up to about 5,400. We dropped down back into the 4,000s, and now we're back up at uh, around 5,700, which is really great because, again, this is a voluntary program, so it's librarians essentially bringing this into their classroom and having their students do it. And depending on the census data you look at, um, you know, it's somewhere around 25, 26,000 students that the materials go out to. Uh, this year, the program was distributed to 142 schools in August. I develop it over the summer, then we send it out. Um, and so I'm in constant contact with the educators right now. Uh, they're all over the state. I'm looking up at this table. I've got someone in every community here in this program. I've got her, Jen, it, what is it, I've got Thatcher Brook. I've got all these schools going. I've uh, got people in, in the Rutland area. i got it all. And it's, it's really exciting because what's important is the kids are getting this information. If you look, since the 2010-2011 school year, we've had almost 38,000 students complete this. And they're repeat. They do it every year. Um, if they start in kindergarten, they might have done this five, six years in a row now. Um, and there's a couple of cool things about that. If they get a college savings account, we know through research that they're more likely to have a college-bound identity, which can lead to good outcomes. And maybe they'll go get a certificate or uh, some sort of post-secondary education that will lead them to success uh, later in life, or maybe just lead them to that interest that will make a difference. So very exciting work there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. But just zipping right along, I do want to touch on after-school financial education. There's a second handout in the materials that we gave you. You're, I expect no one to read all this. There's no homework assignments here. Um, but I really want to want to talk about our after-school program, because we had the idea about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago now, boy, shouldn't we be taking a look at after-school as another opportunity to reach our kids? Um, you know, the kids who do the K-6 program, that five, 6,000 kids, um, we had a concern of, well, how do we verify uh, what their background is, what their opportunities are? We didn't have good data on, are these free and reduced lunch kids? Do they have additional challenges? What's going on at home? All that we knew was how many of our schools were free and reduced lunch based off of looking at where they are, who they are, um, and whether or not they qualify for certain uh, education funding sources and so forth. Um, so here, given the change with, with education standards coming online, I started thinking, well, where else could we go? And after school is a natural fit. Um, and we formed a really great partnership last summer with Vermont After School. Uh, we began developing some curriculum. We took an old uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston curriculum for financial education. We, we were able to uh, dust it off, put in some new information. We incorporate the three books that we do with our K-6 program into it, so we provide some books to the after school centers. Um, and we actually formed it around a mini grant program. So we offered uh, in our pilot class last, this past spring and winter, we offered them mini grants that they would go in. They had some requirements for conducting pre and post assessments. Um, but if you take a look there at the fourth bullet down, the lesson plans are focusing on the core areas we really want to give our kids. Saving, wants and needs, budgeting, scarcity and choices, goods and services, marketing, and starting a business. Um, and the response we've gotten has really uh, astounded us. We have demand from the field to see this increase, so we're hoping to double um, the number of programs we have. We started with 12 in our pilot. They're all across the state. I know I have some in the community. Certainly, I got some in Windsor County, Chittenden County, Rutland County. Um, and it's super exciting to see what we got. We got Washington County covered. I think we even have one in Madison. Um, but we're hoping to double it to, to 24 programs. And Keep in mind, a program, they're all different structures. They might be centered in a school, they might be centered elsewhere, um, but there's typically multiple sites. So of the 12 programs we had in the first year, we had 25 sites. And we were really thrilled to work with our sponsors, the Vermont Bankers Association, 
um, and the TD Bank Charitable Foundation to offer it free of charge. And again, give them the tools. We send them a toolkit, there's play money, there's all these neat things. And I just think that the play-based um, learning for learning about money is really important. And we're able to bake in some entrepreneurship by awarding prizes and things of that nature. So some of these kids were able to actually take some of the prize money, which is about $200 per site, and they were able to do things. They might have a local project they want to do, um, or otherwise, but the key thing is, right, 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 they might want to do something. <laughs> the key is it's in their hands and they're learning through doing. So I just, you know, big uh, shout out to Holly Morehouse and the Vermont After School team. They have been integral to doing this. And I can tell you, you know, I'm over here six months of the year. So these programs that I'm doing, I'm setting them up in the summer where I'm working with stakeholders to send them out. And we need to make sure that we're doing it well because we want to continue to offer these free of charge and continue to entice educators who have no obligation to do it. There's no mandate, it's all voluntary. So we gotta do it well to keep them on board. Um, so just a quick overview there. And then finally, uh, we do have a financial literacy working group I want you to know about. This was an initiative that the governor and treasurer meeting in 2017. Uh, we've had stakeholder meetings across state government with different agencies and departments. Um, and we held a series of meetings last fall. We're working on trying to coordinate more, collaborate more. Um, we need to start meeting again this fall to try to put together our plan for the coming year. But the key thing is we're gonna be launching a website that will have all sorts of fun financial literacy resources on there, trying to make it accessible that folks can go through um, to refer to our reputable community resource providers, because there are so many. And we don't want in government to be doing work that's already being done very well at the local level. We want to find the way to try to break down those barriers and make the transition seamless for our customers who are coming and trying to get services. So there's an effort there to break down some silos. Hopefully I'll have a better update as we move forward, but we are in that direction. And I think it's, you know, my hat's off to the leadership of our treasurer who has um, asked us to do it and to do it well and to do it quickly. So we're doing the best we can there, and I hope to stand some things up that we can talk about with you soon. So there's a lot going on in this space. I'd be happy to answer any questions, um, but what, what is encouraging is that I think there's a rising awareness that, you know, in order for folks to achieve independence, to reach their goals for the future, um, talking about money early is a good idea. Well, yeah, to, to that point, I, I was wondering, have there been, um, you know, long, um, maybe long-term studies that you're aware of, not necessarily in Vermont, but just, you know, in, in the country, about the connection between uh, financial literacy and, and lifting people out of, out of poverty? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, there are all sorts of surveys, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges, I think, is we get a lot of status reports of how are we doing, and, and guess what? They're never good. <laughs> There's incremental progress in areas. Um, if you look around the country, the, there are um, examples of states that are doing it well, but we know all the states are very different. So there are studies that demonstrate certain areas. For instance, college savings accounts, there's all sorts of research. Um, and there's focus group research ongoing right now with, with kids who were enrolled in them, particularly in states like Maine, where they had a huge endowment where they, were, they received this chunk of money from one wealthy donor. They were able to do some of that work. I think that it's going to have to be probably a 10 to 15 year process, though, of waiting for a lot of the results of what we're doing in Vermont. On the other hand, um, I think we know that um, there's a lot of interest in resources. Um, there are community financial institutions who are putting a lot of money into this work right now. For instance, um, the Northfield Savings Bank Foundation is just throwing money mm -hmm. into developing modules for the financial literacy education standards. That's a big deal. Um, and so I would hope that we would be able to measure some proficiency down the road in this area or see it in math or economics. But it's such an interdisciplinary field that measuring is tough. I mean, finance has touched so many parts of our lives and our education system alone, trying to build financial literacy into the practice of classrooms, there is no one place to put it. Mm -hmm. It's all over the map. And so I think that's probably where measuring it is a challenge, but I do know that people are honing in on this. Okay, okay, thank you. Other questions? Thanks, Tom. That's really good to hear, and thank you so much for your work. Yeah, and happy, happy to join. Yeah. And any questions, please reach out. The state treasurer told me to say hello, so if you have any <laughs> Yes, I know she, she was the blogger here, so I guess we, we ought to read this. <laughs> yeah. So please let us know if we can get you out of here. All right, thank you. Good to Thanks, see you all. Okay. Uh, so, um, me, um, we have a few minutes left. I know that um, 
Representative Cooley might want to give us a little update about our plans for our uh, off-site visit. Oh, thank you. Um, we are scheduled um, to be in Rutland City on uh, November 21st, I believe. Um, and we'll be meeting at the, uh, in, uh, the middle school cafeteria, 530. Um, I've asked Tom Donahue, who is the uh, executive director of the Bennington Rutland Opportunity Council, um, to assist in getting uh, people of need there so that we can really hear some some stories and, and the like. So hopefully we'll see you all there. And, um, and but will there be an opportunity? Um, I, I was uh, at a meeting the other day uh, of the, the Wage Coalition, and um, they they talked about an interest in testifying in front of this committee about wages. Um, will there be an opportunity for for other people to come to yes. the public at that meeting? Yes, and I've 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 directed that question to Tom and asked him okay. to provide um, if he if he can. Um, to pro provide time for witnesses, etc., whomever they may be. You may want to contact. Um, I'll ask you to see Tom at, at, at a subsequent meeting. Um, the way it worked in, in um, <clears throat> the North St. John's area, was, yeah. you know, there was a lot, a lot of people, not only providers, but then people from the public and then some teachers and mm -hmm. um, uh, different, different people and individuals. And they kind of came and, and everyone had a chance to speak, but I, I didn't know how it was being set up or whether I that was just I being think worked that's, on. Or... I think you'll see that that program will be similar. Okay, okay. Yeah, and it was like, because we had a small group discussion of yeah, this too, so that, 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 that would be nice, I think, because yeah. it gives us a chance to yeah, sure. kind of interact with people well, a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Larry, could you get, give us, sorry, give us the time and place again. The time is going to be um, 5.30. And it will be at the Rutland Middle School Cafeteria. Where is that? That's on street? Library Avenue. Library Avenue. Um, it's the location of the old high school, the, the old oh. Rutland High School, which is now the intermediate school. And by Grove Street? It's, a, it's by Grove Street, <laughs> yes. And the one, I had 1.30 to 3.30 on my calendar. That's not true. That's, that's not no true. longer the case. That's that no longer no the case. case. So will we have us a... a, a are we leaving the focus of the meeting up to um, the folks at Brock, or are we asking them to, uh, you know, focus on a particular area, whether it's housing or food insecurity or childcare? Or, or I, I haven't really discussed that with Tom, other than the fact that, you know, I, I've told him that we are the, you know, the child poverty, and that's pretty paramount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and should be on the agenda as, as an agenda is formed by these people. But I think that um, um, we'll have a we'll so have it's kind a, of open ended right it's now. It's very so, open. Yeah. We'll have okay. a wide variety of people there. I, I do know that. Okay, I take it there will be a meal. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what that's going to be, but I was assured there will be food okay. provided. Yes. And I think we have ideas or suggestions yeah. about what we'd like to okay. have discussed, and we should let uh, Tom know. So if you want to make suggestions, feel free to let me know. I'll pass along. I, I, yes. I know that I had a nice conversation with Representative um, around this about like what um, I'm here to help you, whatever you, whatever you need, bake some brownies. I'm not too sure what, but the other question I have is I think we child care. Did we have a conversation with Tom, Tom about child care on site? I know meals you are, are under discussion, but. No, I no? have not okay. had that conversation. I didn't ask you that earlier. No. Okay. Yeah. I certainly can have. That, that would be helpful, I think, yeah. It yeah. encourages people who need that to attend. Mm -hmm. Well, I was also just thinking about last year when we were in St. J, when we broke up into groups and there wasn't a lot of local people, so it really depended on who was in your group, and maybe could we, if there aren't a lot of local people, is there a way to, for everybody to hear what those people have to say? Mm -hmm. Tom is making it, uh, he's putting out a, a lot of information to a lot of people. Um, 
that visit his center, uh, whether it be the food shelf or whatever. He's making it well known that this program is coming to Rutland. And the other thing of having it at the having at the school cafeteria, um, most of the people are able to get there. They know the location. They have children, perhaps, in school. Um, and, you know, it's not like having it at the library where it's a little difficult to get to and so on. So, you know, and they feel pretty comfortable at the school. So um, I'm expecting a good turnout. I certainly hope there will be. But Tom is really publicizing this at his operation there in Rutland. Okay. And let's see, Mike, this is from last year, some of the questions that we mm -hmm. Have people discuss? Uh, what do you think of the biggest challenges facing? Yeah. yeah. Can I get a copy of that? Yeah, yeah. that was that. Yeah, just let me know. Sure. Yeah. I'll send this and the address. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. the Robin Middle School, out to the entire council, yeah. so that people yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, and I must say, I do think it was kind of quick kill to have two different groups. Maybe it would be nice to have more of a or plenary, <laughs> and then maybe just have one time for a smaller group. Yeah, um, it doesn't need to be the, the yeah. same. I no, no, no. I just, I just hope yeah. there's an opportunity for people from the community to come in, interact, and talk about what they think is important to them. Right. You know, we held that we held the original poverty council meetings in mostly school cafeterias, so yeah. that yeah. worked very well. Yeah, I still have the original agenda from November 2000. I mean, that was the intent with yeah. my conversation with Tom was the intent to make sure that the local people mm -hmm. are there to Good. present or yeah, speak. I just didn't know, I, I want to make sure that, you know, some people had an interest in attending this, that um, they would be able to come. Yes. Yeah. It is, if, if, if there's a contact, if there's per, a person Maybe organizing the event for Brock or something like that it might be helpful to have a, a contact number or person. Okay. Unless it's just Tom. So. It's Tom. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> great. Well, thank you, Representative Blue. No, That's yeah, great. No problem. And our October agenda is pretty full. We had already gotten requests, so um, we're going to hear about housing and homelessness from uh, Earhart, uh, Help Me Grow Vermont from Janet Kilburn. Uh, ACES from Auburn Water Song and um, TCI, the Transportation Initiative from Michelle Boomhauer. So that will be quite full. And then we do need, I, mean, I think, please keep in mind that our, our, our overarching goal is to make some recommendations, um, you know, um, before the session um, starts. Uh, so I think that's necessitating perhaps a December meeting where we try to um, call uh, all of the different information that we've heard. Um, I was particularly intrigued with uh, Michelle's mm -hmm. suggestion that there might be a suite of, um, you know, legislation that, that voices would, you know, recommend. I think that would be something we'd want to seriously consider, you know, endorsing. Um, but please, you know, please keep that uh, in mind. And if you want to email me in between meetings um, to make sure that there are certain topics that we discuss, um, please do. And um, we'll try to keep moving forward. So I think we're right on time. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much.